A very good afternoon, all of you. This is Bhumika from People Matters, and we are back with another exciting session of our webinar in partnership with Nolscape on the topic, Clearing the Digital Blur, the Role of HR in Digital Transformation. Organizations today are operating in industries that they never have before. Collective innovation has become the norm, and constant iteration is of utmost importance, be it in your products and services, processes, strategies, or workforce development. None of this is possible with technology alone, and the people aspect of digital transformation is more critical than ever before. So how does HR lead the dig digital agenda at the organization? This webinar will focus on what implications does the digital transformation have on HR, how can HR capital to be the change leader and not follower, and how can traditional HR functions be redesigned to be successful in this digital way? To take us through his expert views, I would like to take the pleasure to invite and introduce a speaker for this webinar, Rajiv Jayaraman, CEO and founder, Nolscape. Under Rajiv's leadership, Nolscape has grown into a leading player in the talent transformation space with 200 plus clients across 17 countries. A thought leader and TEDx speaker, he provides overall leadership and direction in strategic areas such as customer success, product roadmap, talent acquisition, and growth strategy. We have saved time for all of you to ask questions at the end of this webinar. For those who are live, can simply post questions at any time during session in the chat section on your right side of the screen. We will try to respond as many questions as the time allows. We have an exciting topic to discuss in this webinar today, and without any further delay, let me invite Rajiv to take over. Thank you so much, uh, Bhumika, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time and uh, being part of this um, uh, very exciting webinar, uh, because this is a topic I have been um, spending a lot of time on thinking and uh, speaking to other people about. In fact, I'm in the process of publishing a book uh, with the same title, Clearing the Digital Blur. I am extremely excited uh, to share some of the insights that I've gained over the last almost 18 months now. So in, in the course of the next 40 minutes, I would like to share with you uh, the concept of HD HR, highly digital HR. What is the role of HR in uh, the process of digital transformation? Let me jump right into it. This is my quick introduction. I'm the founder and CEO of Nolscape. I did my undergrad in Bits Pilani, Masters in, uh, in Computer Science in the US. I worked for Oracle for quite a few years um, before I took a break and uh, went to NCR for my MBA. And I have this creative streak. I was um, a filmmaker and a theater actor before I did my MBA program. The classic right brain, left brain um, uh, challenge is what I faced back then. So I went to NCR, uh, really post NCR, right after it, I started Nolscape. That was almost a decade ago. Um, I'm in the process of writing. I write for um, a lot of magazines and, and, and blogs. I've been a prophet at various B schools. I've done guest lectures at uh, NCR, IM, Bangalore, and a, a few other top B schools. And I've had the good fortune of uh, delivering three TEDx talks, mostly in and around um, the whole idea of learning and using gamification uh, to learn better. That's really uh, very quickly about myself. Uh, those of you who know me well um, would know that I'm an avid quizzer. Um, so if not for anything else, by the end of the 40-minute session post which we will have a Q&A, you will walk away with a lot of trivia. You will feel like you've become a little smart about things that are um, happening around us. So this is our level one question. No points for answering this one. The reason why I included this uh, question is in the process of many interviews I've conducted with leaders, when I asked him this question, the answers are almost always non-standard. I've never got one definition for what people mean by digital. Although this is what our leaders want us to do, this is what everyone is saying the future is all about, but nobody seems to have a good definition for it. I know I have a very knowledgeable audience in front of me, so let's do some crowdsourcing here. Let's set the chat window on fire. Can you please um, add some adjectives and, and start defining what do you mean by digital? Can you spend 10, 15 seconds answering this question? Please leave a note in the chat window. And Bhumika, you can help moderate this one. Definitely. Definitely. 
What do we mean by digital is a question. When you look at it from an HR lens or your industry lens, what are some definitions that uh, you carry or mental models you carry in your head when you are hearing this word? All right, so uh, to just to set expectations, this is supposed to be an interactive webinar. I don't intend to do a one-way talk, so please participate. We have Karuna who says that, according to her, digital is speed. Awesome. So I'm then starting to have, see some definitions. Yeah. Yes. Then we have Vandana. Uh, she says going digital would mean making use of available technology at the optimum. Sheetal Mohan says online and automation is what digital means to her. And then we have Rajri using technology to speed up business, help consumer. We have one more, Manjula, she says, uh, on the click of a button, we have access to everything. That's what digital is. Ramchandra Rao says, digital is equal to anything which is not in physical form. All right, we'll take one more and then we'll, okay, so Venkat Raman says anytime, anywhere, access. So great definitions, all of them. Um, all of them are correct in their own ways. Um, so firstly, there is a difference between digitization and digitalization. I think um, uh, for starters, I think we need to get some clarity on that. Digitization is simply the process of converting something that's digital into something that's, uh, sorry, something that's physical into something that's digital. So if you think about in the last 10 years, things that used to be physical that are now digital, you can count books, music, movies, um, even money for that matter. All of them have become uh, digital. So that's a process of digitization. Now digital is slightly different. It is not just about ones and zeros. Um, the definition that I go with is this, digital is not a thing. When I talk to banks, they say, we've got a mobile app, so that should make us digital, right? Or um, uh, this FMCG company says we've got um, a social media marketing team, so that make us that should make us digital, right? So the answer is no. Digital is not a thing. It is a way of doing things. Obviously, you're leveraging technology to create exceptional customer experience, and you're trying to become internally agile. Your processes become uh, turbocharged because of uh, digital. And the most important thing, according to me, is unlocking new value. So I'd like you to um, think about these three pillars. Creating great experience, here the word customer could mean internal customers as well. Becoming agile from a process standpoint and unlocking new value. The first two are about making things faster, cheaper and better. But the third one is actually about innovation and usually from a business model standpoint. So from my experience, I don't I can't recall of any time when business leaders did not want something to be faster, cheaper, and better. So to that extent, the first two are okay. So they are providing you better ways of doing uh, things faster, cheaper, and better. But the third one, according to me, is truly the, uh, the uh, kicker when it comes to digital. Because here we are unlocking new value. As someone said uh, in the chat, anything that is physical, potentially in the future could become digital. The table in front of you can become digital. How? You, you attach a sensor to the table and you connect it to the cloud and yes, it has become digital. Now, why would I do something like that? I have no idea. But the minute I get some data out of it is when I'll realize the power of what I've done. So that is actually digital helping me think through the physical world from a completely new lens. So let's go with this definition uh, for this presentation. As I mentioned, you will walk away with a lot of interesting tidbits on digital. We'll sort of synthesize all of this into a coherent framework by the end of this presentation. Now, this is gamified. All of you will gain points, and I promise that an Allscape team will send you something interesting at the end of this. So let's start with the first question. This is a one-point question because this has been in the news. So if you don't know the answer to this, you are actually living under a rock. The first person who gets this right will get one point. 
All right, Sheetal, I think, na nails it. Sheetal Mohan, you get one point. Please um, keep a tab on your scores. This is Sophia. The story here is this um, humanoid robot got um, her citizenship. I'm using the word her uh, citizenship uh, in uh, which country was it? Saudi Arabia, right? So now, when I saw this news, I was not too um, uh, alarmed by it. I was not too surprised by it because I knew such technologies existed for a very long time. Couple of uh, key takeaways for me from this one. The first one is, if you look at uh, this robot, and incidentally, this robot was in um, uh, in, in, in India last week. Um, it is part human, part robot. And the backside of uh, this particular um, person, Sophia, is actually um, a machine. Right? Intentionally, they created this uh, in this design. They could have come given this a complete human makeover, but they did not. Second is the kind of social change that sort of started to trigger in the country in which it was launched. Because this is obviously designed after a, a woman, but she's not wearing the traditional attire. So the question was raised. Uh, so in the future, my reading is that such changes will produce deep social changes as well. In the HR domain, we not only have to deal with white collar and blue collar in the future, we also have to deal with the metal collar. Right, that's the reality of HR in the future. Are we ready for the next question? All right, so I'm going to go on. This is again a simple one, so it's a one point question. What are we looking at? Who is this? Again, the first person who gets it gets one point for this question. I think Alap, no, yeah. Alap is answered to this correctly. Okay, Alap, you get one point. The answer indeed is a Robocop. We have seen this in movies, now it is reality. Um, which country is this in? This is in Dubai. Now the interesting thing here is the government of Dubai is saying that by 2030, a significant portion of their unarmed workforce will actually be robotic. For all of us HR professionals, when we uh, think about jobs that cannot be touched by AI or robotics or algorithms, this is um, uh, uh, this is uh, an awakening because most of us would have thought cops are something that cannot be replaced by robots, and here we are. Uh, this is uh, the world's first RoboCop. Now let's move on. Sheetal and Alap, good going. Let's see if you can get the next one. Again, a one-point question because it's fairly obvious what's going on here. The question is, what exactly is going on here? All right, we just have 10 seconds for you to answer this question. I think Alab is again the first person to answer this. He says, uh, chip implant to human. All right, wonderful, Alab, you're on fire. This is, in fact, uh, the microchip implant that uh, human beings are really are willing to insert uh, in, in, their, in their hands. So if you think about what is the use case for this, any place where RFID is used is where um, you can start using this instead. So you can wave your hand, the door opens for you, and you feel powerful. So that's the impact of this. Uh, just kidding. Now, in the future, you can you can almost see what's going to happen next, right? So the next use case that people will invent out of this is employee health, maybe engagement surveys. All of us HR professionals love to do engagement surveys. But think about this. You don't have to do engagement surveys anymore if this becomes mainstream. Why? Because you will know um, if the person's heart is beating faster when the person is walking into the office or is it dead on arrival or is he or she dead on arrival. So that uh, is going to make employee engagement surveys a thing of the past. And many, many such um, inventions can be done on top of it. I dream of the day when maybe I can download uh, Wikipedia onto this chip and then we can safely say I, I know everything that's out there. Right? So um, maybe we are not too far away from that future. Now, uh, we are increasing the stakes here. Uh, this is a medal that stands for five points. We are done with our one point question. What is this? What is this man doing? And what is this device? Don't, don't say this is ATM. I'll give you negative points because this is an ATM, but something, there's something unique about it.
Alap is again the first one to say this is the first Bitcoin ATM. Okay, so I don't know if Alap uh, hacked into my computer earlier, but this is the right answer. Good going, Alap. So this is the world's first Bitcoin ATM. Alap, do you know which country is this in? Shruti says Ireland. No, it's not Ireland. Uh, the answer is Canada. I, I want you to notice that most of these things are happening in countries that are not so obvious. We spoke about Dubai, you, we spoke about Saudi Arabia, you spoke about Canada now. Let, let's move on. I think there are some more interesting questions. So Alap is leading with seven points if I'm not mistaken so far. So here comes the next five point question. What does this symbol represent? For all of us HR folks, LND folks, this is an, an important question. And just to give you a hint, this has something to do with the structure of an organization. Any answers? All right, no answer, so I'm going to go ahead and answer this myself and I get to get uh, gain five points out of this. So this is a symbol that represents what is called as holacracy. Does this ring a bell? Holacracy is actually a new way of organizing companies which replaces conventional management hierarchy. Now, why would you do this? Because in the digital age, agility is extremely important. You're, you're dealing with very agile, nimble, startups out there and as a large incumbent organization, if you don't change the structure of your organization, the way you function, you cannot really um, you know, innovate at the, at the speed of digital. So this structure promises to empower employees to make meaningful decisions and drive change. So a few Silicon Valley companies have um, you know, tried this out. The jury is still out on whether this is actually successful or not, but this is a sign of things to come. I don't know if you've been reading the news about ANZ Bank. They have basically blown up their uh, entire hierarchy and they've become 150 startups. So it makes you think, is the future of a large organization similar to that of a PE fund or a VC fund, which has a bundle of cash and it will fund 150 startups to achieve a certain mission in a certain industry, right? It makes you think. So uh, the point I'm making here is digital comes with this challenge on structure as well. We can't be operating in the traditional hierarchy. We can't be operating in a matrix uh, manner either. We need a newer way of organizing ourselves. <coughs> so the question here is, which country is piloting an AI-based politician? Interesting one. So there is a country in this world that's piloting an AI-based politician. Wouldn't this be a good thing? Excuse me. Any answers to this? <coughs> Excuse me. All right, Garima nails this. I hope you're not Googling Garima. Um, so this is actually the right answer. This is a five point question. So Garima nails it. Alap seven, Garima five. Good going. So this is, um, happening in New Zealand as we speak. I'll move on to the next question. The, the question here is, name some industries that are likely to be impacted by driverless cars. Now, automobile industry is obviously the first one that comes to your mind, but can you name other industries that will be fundamentally reshaped because of this particular innovation? Okay, I can see answers pouring in. Thank you so much for the energy. So I'm, I'm going to count down to, um, to five. Poor answers or names the most number of industries will win. All right, five, four, three, two, and one. Bhumika, can you help me with this? 
we have we have lots of answers people have said automotive insurance telecom healthcare um transportation yeah good going so i'm going to give everyone five points for participating uh, so that everyone feel, feels good about this quiz so obviously automobile industry is one but uh, beyond just the obvious when you think about it uh, most of these are battery driven cars so what's going to happen to the petrol pumps that we have how about the roads they are designed for irrational human drivers you have traffic signals but for cars that are self regulated you don't need traffic signals so the construction the infrastructure industry is going to get um, uh, impacted in a big way insurance as an industry is going to get impacted in a big way um, how about motels so you can actually you know have a peaceful ride in a car and go to um, a place which is you know 6 hours away and you don't really need to fly um, right so assuming that the traffic situation uh, so the point here is one innovation called the driverless car not just is not just impacting one industry it impacts 10 industries in one, in one go and i'll talk more about such innovations in a few slides from now so good going team everyone gets 5 points here Sports fans here, what is going on um, in the world of sports? So last year, Champions Trophy, cricket, if you recall, it was uh, a historic uh, tournament from a digital standpoint. And recently in the game of tennis as well, as you know, the game of tennis was invented somewhere in the 13th century. And it had about 33 odd rules and the 34th rule got um, invented or got introduced last year. It had something to do with digital. What is going on here? So it's not the digital rights for telecast. I think that's been going on for some time now. But something very unique about the core of the game itself. All right, uh, Bhumika, can you help me with this? Who gets five points? Okay, by the way, so the flag is 10 points, so we've increased the stakes here. Let's see who gets 10 points on this one. We have a lot of answers, but uh, I none of the answers are uh, correct over here. So people have written uh, embedded chips in bats, uh, sensors in bats to measure the speed, um, digital rights again, embedded chips. Okay, so the right answer here is Intel Inside. Uh, embedded chips is the right answer. Um, so in cricket bats, tennis rackets, earlier, if you remember, I, I spoke about unlocking new value. Imagine the situation when Roger Federer actually hangs up his, his boots, he retires. Imagine if he had a lot of data about how he plays his shots and he open sources this data and coaches, tennis coaches across the world can now subscribe to this data and start coaching people around the world, right? This was a possibility that never existed in the past, but because there is an embedded chip, because it is now, the racket is now digital, you can get all kinds of data with which you can unlock new economic value. So this is physical and digital interplay at its best. So Bhumika, who gets the points here? Um, I'll have to go back and uh, see. So I'll, I'll let you know after the end of the, end of the okay, webinar. Sure. I'll let you keep the leaderboard. Okay, so uh, who is this? This is again a 10 point question. Who is this gentleman? Okay, Prince Salman. Of Saudi Arabia, not the right answer. Okay, we're running out of time. All right, so I'm going to wrap up this question. Nobody gets uh, the right answer here. So this is the Minister for Artificial Intelligence in Dubai, the world's first Minister for Artificial Intelligence. Now, this is interesting to me because um, I'm sure you're tracking all the noise around AI, the, the way it's going to take away human jobs and so on and so forth. At some point, governments will take keen interest in this development uh, because ultimately it has a huge impact on uh, societies and the way we function. So this is just a sign of things to come. More and more governments will start to regulate AI is my expectation. Food is regulated, energy is regulated, AI has to be regulated at some point in time. 
All right, so uh, we are at the end of the quiz. There is one mega question I have right at the end of it, so we'll, that will give uh, Bhumika some time to uh, collate the leaderboard. Um, so now let me transition into the core concept. Why did I show you all of these examples? If you realize all of these examples had a fundamental transformation underlying all of it, right? So that's entering the era of digital blur. When I read this quote a few months ago, this was a starting point for the book that I am uh, in the process of publishing. And the quote goes something like this. Digital is the main reason why over half of the companies on the Fortune 500 list have disappeared from this list since the year 2000. Now, when I saw this, I was quite intrigued um, because these are successful companies. That's the reason why they are on this list. The leaders of these organizations are tried and tested, they have proven, they have out outperformed the market, they are, they are wonderful leaders. But what is unique about digital, because this is not the first time we are seeing a transformation like this. Many such transformations have happened in the past. So what is unique about digital? When I started asking this question, I realized that many of the lines that we are used to in the business world and otherwise are blurring away. But what sort of lines are these? Let's find out. When I started making a list of lines that are blurring away, at a personal level, I realized that the line between work and life has blurred away. I think we can all relate to that. And when I made a, a, a more comprehensive list, I came up with at least 20 different things that have blurred away, but we are still hanging on to these lines, and there lies, lies the problem. We are still operating in the industrial playbook, uh, using the industrial playbook, but the game has changed. So the question is, what sort of lines are these? Let's find out. Now, BLUR stands for, is an acronym, and it stands for Boundaryless Organizations, Limitless Digitization, Unbounded Innovation, Relentless Iteration. So some of the examples that I've shown you so far are examples of exactly this. Boundaryless organizations, what does that actually mean? Inside the organization, the, uh, the division between sales and marketing, product and sales, all of these uh, divisions or lines will disappear in the future. Holacracy is an example of that. And if you think about why this is happening in the industrial era, the product was right in the center and all the functions were organized around the product and the product like in an assembly line would go through different steps and the end point of that assembly line is the customer. So it, it is a pipe, it is a line, it is a linear model where the product goes from one place to the other. But in the digital world, the product is not in the center, the customer is in the center. The customer is in the center and the entire organization organizes itself around the, around the customer, which would mean for every customer touch point, from acquisition to retention, you will have a multifunctional team. So there's no concept of sales and marketing. You'll have a customer acquisition team that knows how to do this thing, right? So to that extent, internally inside the organization, the boundaries are going to be reformed. Between the organization and the outside world, the lines have become a lot more porous with open source, open innovation. You know, value is crossing the boundaries very freely these days. And think about the uberization of the workforce, the liquid workforce. Most of the people that are delivering value for your organization are actually outside the organization. So that's the concept of the boundaryless organization. The second one, limitless digitization, is a story of data, sensors, AI, and robotics. We spoke about this already. You attach a sensor to any physical thing, it becomes digital. So the real question here is, how do organizations and leaders deal with this heightened sense of intelligence surrounding us? How will we deal with that situation? The third one is unbounded innovation. We spoke uh, about the driverless car. That's a classic example of something that changes the boundaries of industries. It just doesn't impact one industry. It just decimates a lot of industries in one go. Think about blockchain or AI. These are all called disruptions of disruptions. We know disruption is underway, but blockchain has a potential to disrupt the disruption itself. Right, So that's unbounded innovation. And relentless iteration is my personal favorite because I used to uh, work for Oracle a long time ago. And uh, around that time, we had a yearly launch, Oracle 8, 9, 10, and so on and so forth. So that, that is the industrial model. Today, when you think about it, what version of Chrome are you on? What version of Angry Birds are you on? The question is, do you really care? The answer is, you don't. What you care about is the experience. 
and for that experience to be created, organizations are operating at relentless speed, right? And so that's the whole concept of agility. So you will realize that all these four areas are things that digital born organizations are living and breathing by, whereas incumbents are not really thinking about this. And that is the real source of digital disruption that is happening in today's context. And let me say something about this, about HR and the role of HR. I see a lot of uh, business leaders talking about this in today's context. I'm sure you are alarmed by it. They are saying, by 2020, HR is dead. HR has no role in the digital future. Now, when I see something like that, this is how I process it. I say, that is true. HR is dead. On similar lines, marketing is dead. Supply chain is dead. Finance is dead. Pretty much every function is dead. The reason why I say that is the rules of the game have changed. Right? It is true that we need to play by different rules, but that doesn't mean that human resources or the focus on human beings will become any lesser in the digital world. If anything, I think the focus on human beings is going to, or human resources is going to become a lot more important in the digital age. And I'll explain why in a few slides from now. So if you think about what are business outcomes after all, if you want to convert this into a mathematical equation, it is digital strategy plus capabilities plus culture. Now think about it, out of these three things, what are the two things that are directly under the control of HR and L&D? Capabilities and culture, right? So if someone tells me that capabilities and culture are not important in the digital age, I don't know what to say about that because to me, these are the most vital things in the digital age. So uh, HR friends and folks, uh, we are all part of the same community. I'm, I'm here to tell you that we have an incredibly important role to play in the digital future. All it takes from our end is imagination, courage to break a few rules and rewire the way the game is played. And I'm sure we are all capable of doing that. So when you think about digital strategy, essentially what it is is the ability to make some sense of what is happening out there, creating a clear path to the digital future and the ability to cascade that message to the rest of the organization. Digital capabilities is all about orbit shifting customer experience. We saw the definition of digital um, earlier, customer experience, agility, and uh, unlocking new business value, right? So design thinking, agility, and analytics become the bedrock of digital capabilities. And of course, all of this would not be possible if leadership and culture were not, uh, is not supporting this capability building. So all of these three parts are crucially important for achieving outcomes in the digital age. Now, I'm, I'm sure all of you are thinking about how do I now do this for my organization, right? Basic principle here is digital is an organizational capability. It is not an individual capability. Of course, there are parts of it that are very individual, centric, team centric, but ultimately it is an organization's DNA. Now, how do you build digital as an organizational DNA? The, to us, there are four different parts that you need to think about. One is digital awareness, and this is broad based. Everyone in the organization needs to know about what does digital mean? What does IoT mean? What does robotics mean? And what does it mean for my industry and for my role? That awareness is super crucial for you to be able to formulate a response to what's happening out there. Of course, digital strategy is something that needs to be very clearly thought out and uh, leaders need to uh, unlearn a few things and relearn strategy in the age of uh, the digital blur. And at Nullscape, we have evolved a, a framework called the LeapFrog uh, framework, which allows a traditional organization to leapfrog from their linear pipe-based, assembly line-based business model to something that is more networked, that is more digital ready. So that's the digital strategy layer. Then you have digital execution, which is more about methodology. Irrespective of which function you belong to, finance, marketing, sales, there are certain things that you need to do right in the digital age. So here we focus quite a lot on methodologies like design thinking, uh, the lean startup approach, <coughs> the ability to derive value out of data, so all of that is part of digital execution. And overarching is digital leadership. In the digital world, leaders are at all levels, right? So we need to build leaders at all levels, and these are aligned to certain crucial digital capabilities. So I'll speak about that in the upcoming slides. Now from a strategy perspective, now let's start peeling the onion, and, and you can now start plotting what it means for HR. So in the boundaryless world, 
organizations need to come up with ecosystem as a strategy. You need to build the ecosystem, like Uber does it, Amazon does it, Google does it. It's an ecosystem and a platform story. Second is limitless digitization, where data is the core strategy, right? How do you derive value from data? As they say, data is a new oil or data is a new soil, depending on what works for you. The third is unbounded innovation, where design becomes core strategy. Organizations need to get great at design because experience is at the crux of it. And relentless iteration is all about agility, not just from a project management perspective, but truly from a strategic direction perspective. Now, leadership competencies. What are some new kinds of leaders that we need to produce for the digital age? In the boundaryless world, we need network leaders who are not, you know, sitting on their high throne of power. They use informal power. They use influence. They are able to use uh, collaboration as a currency and, and work with people inside and outside the organization. Um, so we need a network leader. Limitless digitization is a story of data, right? So you, you're facing massive amounts of data in today's context. So this leader is able to connect the dots, make sense, derive insights, and narrate a compelling story to the rest of the organization and to the world outside. So those are some leadership competencies that we need to think about. A design leader is a design thinker out of the box, right? So this person is able to assemble ecosystems both inside and outside the organization, is able to design compelling customer experiences. And finally, agile leader is able to change the strategic direction of the company and um, is able to rapidly iterate on what is important for the customer. So these are the new leadership competencies, and of course it has an impact on culture and competencies as well. So in the boundaryless world, we need the org culture to be open, pairing, and sharing. Easier said than done. HR has a, a very big task cut out in front of it. By 2020, we need organizations that are open, pairing, and sharing. Data-driven decision-making should be part of the core culture, not HIPPO. This is a term that I came across um, recently. HIPPO doesn't stand for high potential, unfortunately. It stands for highest paid person's opinion. That's how we seem to be making decisions in today, today's context. That needs to give way to data-driven decision-making. Diversity and inclusion is not just a tick mark on your agenda. It is imperative for innovation to happen. Without diversity of ideas and unlocking those ideas for the organization, an organization cannot be unbounded in its innovation. And finally, fail-fast culture, uh, we need experimentation to happen at all levels within the organization. And if the organization doesn't embrace failure, smart failures, you know, digital transformation cannot happen. So these are the cultural pillars that we need to anchor towards. And now let me spend a minute on what this means for HR. At Nolscape, we have evolved a framework called HDHR, which is Highly Digital uh, HR. And uh, so again, it is mapped to the blur concept. So in the blur world, boundaryless organizations entail that uh, HR now starts to think about fluid organization design. How do I make all my fixed resources and, and people and teams into fluid resources? How do I use AI in my talent acquisition, selection, staffing process? Right? That's, that's going to go a very long way. Limitless digitization is a, is a story of data, as I mentioned earlier. Now, what are we doing with that data? Right from the minute a person comes into work, um, so hired to retire, what are some data points that we can uh, derive and what, what insights can we use? That's the crux of uh, HR analytics. Unbounded innovation is all about employee experience. How can we use design thinking, gamification, omni-channel delivery? All of these are important building blocks for building a great uh, employee experience. And finally, relentless iteration. Uh, anytime you hear the word annual in your discussions, you can safely start questioning it in today's context because everything is moving towards real time and continuous. Continuous performance, feedback, reward model, and so on and so forth. So this is the architecture of the HTHR um, offering that we have, and, and I believe these are some fundamental building blocks for, for HR, and, and we will be playing these roles uh, going forward in the digital future. So a little bit about that, uh, digital awareness is essentially a techno-functional cut on what digital means. And there are very interesting ways of doing this. Um, I know there is a business as, as usual which is not digital. If you want to uh, get a quick dipstick on how digitally ready we are, 
um, you know, Active Quiz is a, is a platform which allows you to do digital uh, awareness in a highly gamified fashion. It gives you a lot of insights and analytics on how ready you are uh, as an organization for the digital world. And I promised you that there will be a, a mega question in the end and a mega story as well. So can anyone name this individual? Who are we looking at? Who is this? So as you can see, this is a 16 point question. So 10 plus 5 plus 1, 16 points. So if you win this, there's a good chance that you will actually walk away with the prize. All right, I think I saw the right answer. Bhumika, can you just check across Q&A and chat who gave the right answer? Yes, so Alap again is the <clears throat> winner. He has written, I think, it's, I, I'm hoping it's a spelling mistake. He has written Kasparov instead of uh, Gary. Yeah, it's correct. It's, it's a C instead of a K. Okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll excuse that mistake. Uh, this is indeed... Gary Kasparov, uh, great going, and I see the right answer across the board. Garima, you got it right as well. Uh, good, so you're all clued in. Um, I'm fascinated by the story. Uh, if you've not watched his TED Talk, please do that. It's my all-time favorite TED Talk. The core message that he is giving us is, do not fear intelligent machines. And I think he's a very credible person to give us that message because I'm, I'm sure you know his history. Something incredible happened in the year 1997-98 time frame. Any idea what happened to him during that time? So this is Gary Kasparov, G-A-R-R-Y, K-A-S-P-A-R-O-V. He is a chess champion. Something interesting happened in his life around the 97-98 time frame. That's right, uh, Ravina has the right answer for it. Unfortunately, this is not um, a formal question where you'll get, get some points. But the answer is he lost to the IBM Deep Blue computer, the supercomputer. <coughs> now, what's interesting about this is there were two contests. The first one, he actually won. But nobody talks about it. The second one, he lost, and that becomes headline news. He didn't take to that result too well. Obviously, he's a grand champion, and he gets beaten by the stupid computer. And he says... You know, this is unfair because the uh, supercomputer is connected to millions and millions of uh, past uh, game records, and I have none. So what will be a fair fight is when I get connected to a computer as well, and then we have this contest. So they started doing this research on human-AI combination, um, and in the year 2014, guess what, guess what happened? The human and machine combination actually systematically beat the machine. To me, this is an empowering story. It is truly empowering. It gives me the goosebumps every time I think about it because today, in today's context, every single organization where we have done some digital program, the anxiety levels are terribly high. People are worried. They are anxious. What's going to happen to my future? And this is not just frontline employees. Mid-managers all the way to senior leaders are saying, I hope I retire by the time this actually hits us. Right? So that, that's a sad, sad state of mental state. So, but to me... This attitude, this mindset of embracing intelligent machines is an empowering story. And I'm sure you will narrate this story to the next person who comes to you and asks you, hey, what's going to happen to your job? The answer here lies in capability building. The machines are learning. The real question is, are we? On that note, let me pause. I'm sure you're, you're filled with questions. You're curious about a lot of things, and I think I'm on time um, so far. I'm happy to take any questions that you may have on whatever I've discussed so far. Thank you, Rajiv. It was a wonderful session, and we'll now move on to the questions from our attendees. So I have the first question with me. Rakesh has a very interesting question. He wants to know, uh, he first, you know, he says that some years back, uh, we had this trend of e-commerce, e-marketing, e-governance. Now we are hearing digital marketing, digital commerce, digital governance. So is it just another phase or something else this time? Okay, brilliant question, Rakesh. I'm glad you asked that question. Um, I've been personally tracking this over a period of time as well. So a couple of years ago, if you walked into any conference, you would have heard the acronym SMAC. Does anyone recall that? S-M-A-C. SMAC. Does anyone know what that stands for? 
I'm going to reveal the answer. So, um, social media, mobility, analytics, and cloud. But today, if you'll notice nobody is talking about smack. Suddenly, digital is what um, is the new flavor of the season. But I do believe, uh, from all the interviews I've conducted with senior leaders, this time around, it seems like it is um, really different because we are not really talking about a technology trend. Digital end of the day is not about technology. It is about, as I mentioned earlier, it is about mindset, it's about a way of doing things. In my definition, I said it's, a, it's, it's how you leverage technology, that's just one part of it, to create great customer experience. So right now, the way we are looking at it is from a business lens, it's from a service lens, it's from a, a platform lens. So I do believe that digital will uh, stick on for some time, and I'm pretty sure the definition will change, new things will get added to this, um, but I think what we need to stick with is the new norms that are getting built, the new uh, ways we are getting structured. <coughs> These labels may change, but I think fundamentally the building blocks are shifting, and that's a real trend. Thank you, Rajiv, for that answer. Uh, we'll move on to our next question. It is uh, by Rakesh again. He wants to know, are we not making a big hype by using digital excessively by prefixing it to every term, while in the actual sense, all of it is, uh, all it is saying is uh, to do things in a better way by using smart technologies around, which most of the process improvement projects also say. Yeah, so you're, you're right about that. So we need some kind of an anchor for people to understand things in a certain way. The problem right now, the reason why I chose the title as Digital Blur is exactly because of that, uh, because it, it's a little blurred, like e-commerce and e-marketing and this and that. Digital is in fact getting used uh, left, right and center, uh, just like how strategy is a pet word for all of us. We have a strategy for crossing the road. Um, right, so it gets overused, that's a little unfortunate, but, but we do on the other hand need some common terminologies, common frameworks to understand what is going on around us. Today I can't claim that there is clarity, right, so it's useful to have co common nomenclature, but we need to stay a little wary of overusing it in every uh, single context, so I, I appreciate that sentiment. I hope that answers Rakesh's question. We'll move on to our next question from Saloni. In the debate of man versus machine, can you share that one HR role which technology will never be able to replace? Okay, so I would like to uh, like you to shift your frame framing a little differently. Uh, assume that you will be replaced and act accordingly. And that will empower you. Trust me that that's going to empower you. Um, there are three things that I've thought about on this uh, on this particular topic, and I've you know gone really deep into this. So when you think about the human AI uh, confluence, right? Uh, there are different points of view. Uh, the jury is still out on what's actually going to happen. I'm going to lay out three scenarios in front of you and take a pick, and all of these are relevant scenarios. Scenario one is the Elon Musk. Um, school of thinking, which says that, you know, we are going to lose the plot to AI, AI is going to dominate us and we'll all be jobless and we'll, uh, and they are talking about uh, universal basic income and things like that. This is real, right? These are conversations that are happening at government corridors as we speak, um, right? So that's the doomsday scenario where we would have lost uh, it all to AI and robotics and they start collaborating beyond the specialized AI and algorithms. The minute they start collaborating is when the danger happens and we, we look at singularity after that. So that's scenario one. Scenario two is the Gary Kasparov scenario, the one that I spoke about where human beings start to learn how to use the machine. Think about how we use the GPS, right? We use it for direction. But of course we know that the street that the GPS is asking us to get into doesn't have the space for an SUV, right? Or the fact that something has, has been dug up five minutes ago, we, we know that, right? So I think there is always some value for uh, human intelligence, the contextual intelligence, and if you mix that wisely with machine-based intelligence, I think that combination is uh, bound to be powerful. That's, that's the story that I left you with, uh, with respect to Gary Kasparov. The third school of thought is um, essentially uh, what uh, Yuval Noah Harari, the, the author of Sapiens, talks about. He's saying that, uh, you know, human beings are not dumb. We, we are actually smart. We may not think so, but we are actually smart. We've um, outgrown many, many catastrophes in, in the past. We've survived all of them. So in the future, we'll all become bionic. 
so we'll all uh, get a new avatar. We'll all become human beings 2.0. Not no reference to the Rajni Kant movie that's coming up later this year. But uh, um, we, we, you know, think about it. Many of us um, today have uh, pacemakers inside them. We have artificial limbs. We have uh, all kinds of artificial things inside us. Um, so why can't we upgrade our DNA? Uh, so that that's already done. So there are all of these three possibilities that are in front of us. Um, the jury is still out. We don't know what's going to happen exactly. Now narrowing it back to the specific question you asked about HR, I would recommend that you start thinking in terms of what is the true human experience that you can provide, where empathy can play a role, where storytelling can play a role. Um, right. So these are truly human things. So my, my own hypothesis, and I hope I'm true about this, is as AI becomes more and more human, I, I hope humans become even more human and not robotized. The danger is when we get robotized, and that's what we are today, most of our HR operations, and not just HR, but every other function operates in an industrial one-size-fits-all fashion. That industrialized way of working is what AI will disrupt. But anything more personal, anything more human, we are very uniquely placed, at least at this point in time, to do that. So I, I would encourage you to look at the portfolio of things you are working on and ask yourself what is truly human in what I am doing and pursue that. Long-winded answer, but I, I hope I was able to provide uh, the context. Yes, I'm sure that uh, answers Saloni's question. We'll move on to our next question, which is from Barkha. Uh, what will be the role of HR in future after digitization? Oh, I, I think um, HR, by the way, may not be called HR in the future. We will invent something else, um, right? I, I don't. Human resources is again a very industrial way of looking at things, right? Uh, so I don't think, firstly, we should drop um, um, HR as a, as, a, as a functional name. I think execution assurance. I like that because. Um, if you go by, by the math formula I gave you, strategy plus capabilities plus culture, while strategy is the plan, the execution is happening through capability and culture. So can HR be now called the execution assurance team? Because you know the people, you know the capabilities, you know the culture, you know the leadership. So why can't we take on that execution role? Right? We are the coaches for the organization, but today we are not playing that role. So I think that's the new role for HR in my mind. Um, and in that, we are constantly looking at how structures need to change in the boundaryless world, how we will use data to create um, great insights about our people. Uh, we'll use design to create great employee experience, not just within the organization, but also for the gig economy folks who are outside the organization. How do I create great experience? And how do I um, actually act in a very agile fashion? So all of these are extremely important from an HR uh, perspective. Thank you for that answer, Rajiv. Uh, our next question is from Kalidos. He asks, how do you equip all generations in this digital platform? All right. <clears throat> uh, it's a great question. Um, so in fact, I, I think there is a little bit of a myth hiding behind that question, which I want to bust up front. Um, so in my experience, uh, th yeah, th you're right that there are certain attitudes that maybe the Gen Xers and, uh, and the baby boomers may have about digital and uh, and all of that and and we seem to think that youngsters are ready to lap up digital i can tell you from my experience uh, of having worked with 300 plus lnd teams across 25 countries there is a little bit of a myth there we are hearing more and more that learners in their 20s seem to want a high touch in classroom experience the reason being they are a little clueless they don't know what they want in life they are directionless and, and they would like to get more of a um, uh, high touch experience. But as employees mature, they get into their 30s and 40s, it seems like we seem to understand what we really are looking for and we are able to find what we are looking for in a very efficient way. So I, I've seen all angles to this. Um, uh, so I've, seen, I've heard people say, you know, millennials have an advantage, but really, I think the way we should look at it is who has learning agility in the organization? That's the real question. Uh, to quote a personal example, my mom, uh, when I was in the U.S., learned how to disassemble and assemble a computer because she wanted to communicate with me. When there is a need, you will learn. And today, I have a computer science background. I can't disassemble and assemble a computer. Even today, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to say that. But my mom can because she has the learning agility and she had the need to do it. 
And so, to me, multi-generation is what, not what we should be worried about. We should be worried about whether people have learning agility or not. Rightly said, Rajiv. I'll move on to the next question. Uh, what kind of skill set competencies related to di digital is business expecting HR to possess? Sorry. All right, that's a wonderful question. I think the first thing HR needs to do is understand that the business side is also confused. Uh, right, so this is your moment of truth, moment of opportunity to lead. My ideal, in my ideal world, learning should lead business. Just like the way, in some cases, IT or digital is leading business, why can't learning and capability building lead business? Because businesses are thinking about the future, right, 2020. If you can start building capability for the future, business would love you, right? So to that extent, the first set of people that need to unlearn and relearn happens to be the HR community. And as I said earlier, B-L-U-N-R means a, a little bit of things for HR. You need to think in terms of fluid organization design. Competency-wise, we need to be a lot more networked, a lot more outside in than we are at this point in time. We are probably too operational at this point in time, but can we bring in best practices from the outside world? Can we be data-driven? Can we be design thinkers right out of the box? Can we operate in an, uh, in an agile um, fashion? So these, I think, are core capabilities for HR as well. Um, so I, I, I would love uh, for you to um, you know dig deeper into each of these and, and think about what would you specifically change in your routine today, not tomorrow, not day after, but today. Uh, how can you become outside in? How can you use data better? Whatever information you have with you, how can you derive insights out of it? How can you start redesigning the way you're offering experience to your employees? And how do you create a 10x sort of a model in the way you're operating? Uh, more pace, more stability, more agility in the way you're offering your HR services. Thank you for that answer, Rajiv. Uh, we'll move on to our next question. It is from Rakesh again, and it's a very interesting question. What's your view on while today humans are training machine, in future do you think there would be situation when machine will train other machines? What role human will play, mainly from India's standpoint where most of the jobs are transactional? Yeah, something we need to worry about uh, for sure, because we have the demographic dividend at this point in time something like 60-70% of, um, of our workforce is below the age of 30, right? And, and we need a career path for all of them. We need to be very creative in the way new jobs are created. We need to be agile about it. Um, just to take a leaf out of history, um, this whole industrial era played out over 100 years. The service economy played out over 40 years. This digital transformation will not give us 100 years or 40 years. It will happen over a decade. So the time uh, span that we have to do this digital transformation is not a lot, unfortunately. A lot of disruption would have happened uh, in this time frame. So um, I don't know if you watched this uh, video recently, which has been doing the rounds, um, a video by Boston Dynamics, which shows that um, a dog-like creature, I think a robot obviously, is uh, walking across a room. Uh, it can't open a door, right? But there is a specialized another dog uh, uh, resembling robot, which knows how to open the door. So this, the first dog stands in front of the door, the next one opens it, and both of them exit the door, right? So that's a scary situation because um, you are now starting to see machines coordinating with, with the other, right? And one of the uniqueness about, uh, about humans is we have flexible co cooperation. We understand concepts like money and religion and capitalism and things like that which is very unique to human beings. Uh, and the minute machines start to build flexible cooperation like that is when we need to be really um, worried about, you know, what does that actually mean for us? Um, so yes, I do foresee that uh, machines have already started teaching uh, each other. Um, I'm, I'm in no uh, illusion that this won't happen even more rapidly in the future. So it does have a huge impact on what it means for uh, the kind of jobs that we will have in the future. And this is also something I know. The industrial era was supposed to, because of all the automation and railroads and things like that, we were supposed to have a relaxed life because the machine of, of the yesterday's world was supposed to set us all free. And you know what happened, right? We are probably a lot more busier than we were in the 1800s. And I foresee that it's a unique human capability to create problems of gigantic proportions global warming and 
And all of those things that are that we are facing as a result of industrial uh, revolution are things that not not a single individual can solve. We need to all collectively come together and solve it. So I'm pretty sure of our abilities to create more problems than we can solve. So I'm counting on that. Uh, a little bit of a pessimistic view there, but that's that's been the future from uh, that's been the the past for us. Um, and so I'm, I'm sure we'll end up creating more uh, jobs which are likely to be different from what they were earlier. So as long as we have growth mindset and we keep learning, I think we should be okay. Thank you so much, Rajiv. Uh, due to paucity of time, we'll now have to wrap up today's webinar. We have a lot of questions coming in which I would request you to take offline. Sure. And then, so who is the winner of the contest, uh, Bhumika? You need to reveal the name as well. It's, uh, it's, we have a clear winner. It's Alap. Okay, good going, Alap. Congratulations. So you can expect something from Northcape. Congratulations, Alap. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to thank our webinar partner, Northcape, and our speaker, Rajiv, for invaluable information. Meanwhile, you can provide your feedback in the survey link provided in the chat section because your inputs matter a lot. Stay tuned for many more such exciting sessions. Have a great day. Thank you, everyone. I hope it was useful.